John chapter 1. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday. Um, we are believing for some visitors. We have a, we're going to have a photo booth set up, take some pictures for them for Easter. And we've been handing out invitations to let people know here, put all over Facebook and other social media. And so next Sunday, I'm not going to preach your normal Palm Sunday message. I'm going to take us from Palm Sunday to the cross to the grave and preach a message of salvation. Next Sunday, we will sow the entire week of passion and show the power of the cross and the power of Jesus, what he did for us. The following Sunday is Easter. We have pancake breakfast at 930 and then 11 o'clock our Easter service. And in that service, I will be talking about the hope of Easter, what we can experience today because he rose from the grave. Sunday after that will be Family and Friends Sunday. We're going to be preaching a message of invitation to the people to tell them about God and tell them about the church. It's casual. Everybody dressed comfortable. We're going to have a picnic outside, weather permitting, weather not permitting. We're going to have a picnic inside. I don't know how we're going to fit the grill in the kitchen, but we're going to have, we're going to have fun. Family day. We're going to play games. We're going to enjoy ourselves and really have a great time of fellowship. So that's the plan for the next few weeks. This morning, though, what I'd like to do is finish our series on being rooted in Jesus. We've been talking about that for the past four weeks, trying to understand really what it means to be grounded in Him. Uh, C.S. Lewis said, The Son of God became a man so that men may become the sons of God. And we have a verse that we've been looking at through this series, and it was Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 10. It'll be up on your screen in just a moment if you want to Read that together with me this morning. This is the word of the Lord. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy or empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in Him who is the head of all principality and power. As we look through the Gospels, and that's what we've done through this series, we've taken a passage out of Matthew, Mark, and Luke so far to try to give us an understanding of who Jesus really is. And today we're going to be going to John chapter 1, verse 1, if you want to get your Bibles ready. But if you look up on your screen, you'll see the first chapter of any book sets the stage for the rest of the book. Anytime you read a book, the first chapter, that opening chapter, kind of sets the stage. Can you see that? Do I need to turn the light off? Can everybody read it okay? Okay. The first chapter sets the stage for the book, so we really know what the book's going to be about. Matthew talked about Jesus as king. That was his focus as he wrote the, his gospel to promote the fact that Jesus was the Messiah, the king that came through the lineage of David to tell the Jewish people that the Messiah had come. So the book of Matthew starts out immediately with your genealogies. Starts out Adam to Abraham to David to Jesus so that we can see where Jesus came from. In the book of Mark talks about Jesus is a servant. So he skips all the stuff in the beginning and goes right into his ministry. Mark is a book of action. It was written to the Romans who were an action-oriented people. And so Mark's goal was to show Jesus as the servant who helped people, who suffered for people. And so he started out with his ministry right away. And then the book of Luke was there to show that Jesus was fully man. So the book of Luke starts out with his birth. How Jesus came as a baby, how Mary and Joseph were there with the manger, how the shepherds came, how the wise men came. John, on the other hand, is different from all the other Gospels because John's specific purpose of writing his book was to declare that Jesus is God. So he doesn't start with genealogies, he doesn't start with ministry, he doesn't even start with his birth. He starts with this, in the beginning was the Word. The Word made flesh. That's what I'm going to try to talk to you about, and I promise you I won't get it finished. If I do, we'll be here for about six weeks, but I'll try to get at least part of it done for you this morning. Go with me to the Word of God, John chapter 1, 
We're going to go ahead and read verses 1 through 18. It'll be up on your screen. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. We're going to have to stop there, because I know I won't get any further, so we'll just stop right there, okay? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, I ask you, Lord, today to illuminate your scripture to us, to illuminate your word to us, and help us to scratch the surface and comprehend and understand just exactly who Jesus is, so we're not swayed by philosophy or vain deceit or traditions of men, but like your word says, we are fully rooted and grounded in him. We ask all these things in your name today, precious Lord. Amen, amen, amen. Gospel of John was one of the last books in the New Testament that was written. It was probably written from the city of Ephesus, where the apostles served as a pastor after the destruction of the Jerusalem temple in 70 AD. So probably this gospel was written 50 to 60 years after Jesus rose from the grave written much later than the first three. The first three are called the Synoptic Gospels because they follow Jesus' life chronologically. John doesn't do that. He didn't need to because the other three Gospels had already been written at this time and circulated to the churches as well as all the letters of Paul and Peter. So by this time that John writes this passage, everybody already knows everything in the New Testament through Paul. Okay, Matthew, Mark, Luke, all the letters of Paul, already written, already circulated. So John doesn't have to retrace any of the events already described in the other Gospels. He doesn't have to write a chronological biography of the life of Jesus. His purpose is not to detail the ministry of Jesus. John is selective in what he includes in the Scriptures. And his selection points to a distinct purpose, one he provides for us. If you go all the way to the very end of John and read the very last part in John 20, 30-31, this is what he says. And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So the reason why John wrote his gospel was that we may believe Jesus is Christ and the Son of God, and that in believing we may have life. So John addresses this question right away in the very beginning. Who is Jesus? John focuses upon the central fact of our Christian faith. Christianity is not a philosophy. Christianity is about a person. And that person is fundamental to our faith. You have a quote up on your screen here in just a moment. Devin Hudson said, To remove Jesus from Christianity... No, you don't. Never mind. Don't pay attention to me. I don't know what I'm talking about. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Don't worry. You're fine. Just, just be quick. Just click when I say stuff. Just find something. Find something that looks good and put it on the screen. Devin Hudson said, To remove Jesus from Christianity is like taking numbers out of math or like taking the sun out of daylight. It is to strip Christianity of its most essential um, component Without Jesus, we cannot have Christianity. Without Jesus, we cannot have a true understanding of God. Without Jesus, we cannot have a true understanding of God's holy word. You can't take Jesus out of the equation. Other religions focus upon teachings and ideas and philosophies of their founders and teachers. Christianity doesn't do that. Christianity is about personal relationship with a real person. That's why Jesus Christ is the most astonishing individual in human history. More books have been written, more music's been composed, more pictures have been painted about Jesus than any other person. 
Other great figures have come, and they've gone. They've risen up empires. The empires have fallen. But Jesus Christ looms as large today in modern society as he did over 2,000 years ago. So that's the question John answers in this passage. Who is Jesus? Who is this person that comes along? And that's what we're going to try to examine. We're going to try to examine these verses. And if you go to the next slide, let's see what that one says. Well, I already read that. Next one. Hey, there we go. That'll work. Jesus. It's not his fault. It's my fault. I don't have a... There's no way to know when my next slide is, so I have to give him subtle signals. Jesus is the Word of God. John begins his gospel very unusually. He doesn't start with a greeting. He doesn't start with a salutation. He doesn't start by giving us some kind of a background story. He immediately comes out and says, In the beginning was the Word. Does that sound familiar? That's how Genesis starts, all the way in Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning. So John is recapitulating the concept of beginning in this passage here. He moves beyond human history. He takes us all the way back to the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. John starts with the God. In the Bible, you can't go any further back than God. And that's where John begins in eternity past with God's eternal purpose. And what does he tell us? In the beginning was the Word. So in the beginning, from all eternity, the Word has existed. In other words, the Word has eternally existed. The Word became flesh. God became a man. The infinite became finite. The eternal one entered time. The invisible became visible. Now why didn't John say in the beginning was the Son of God? Why didn't John say in the beginning was the Messiah? Why didn't he say in the beginning was Christ? In the beginning was Jesus. Why did he say in the beginning was the Word? Well, when he was talking, he was giving us a concept that we could really and truly understand. And I don't want to mess with anybody's theology this morning. But Jesus was the Messiah when he came to earth. Jesus was our Savior when he died on the cross. Jesus is our High Priest right now making intercession with us and at some time in the future only God knows when Jesus will come back claim us as our own and will become our king of kings and our lord of lords but before Jesus was ever our king before Jesus was ever our high priest before Jesus was our prophet before Jesus was our savior before Jesus was our sacrificial lamb before he was any of these things Jesus was the word so way before anything happened, way before Jesus ever showed up on the scene in a physical form, He was already there as the Word. Logos. That's the Greek for Word. Logos means Word. It was very common in first century Greece. It was the word John employs to capture the attention of his audience. If you were Greek and you heard the word Logos... You would understand it was a representation of the soul of the universe. The Greeks believed that Logos, or Word, was the rational principle from which everything came. A creative, stabilizing, governing force of the universe. Kind of like the force in Star Wars. That's a shout out to the nerds in the audience. You know who you are. But this Logos was believed to be a title given to a creative, impersonal force which governed intelligent mind in the universe. This was an abstract mind. So the Greeks heard the word logos, and they understood an abstract governing body that governs everything, but has no personality, has no relatability. It's just there. That was the Greeks' concept of the world. Read the works of Plato. Read the works of Aristotle. You will see this concept over and over again. They believed there was an overarching force that governed the world, but they couldn't give it a name. They even worshipped an unknown God because they couldn't give it a name. So when John writes this passage, he tells them that Logos is not an impersonal power. The Logos is not some kind of floating principle of reason. The Logos is a person. 
To the Greek mind, the Logos was the most powerful force in the universe. Creative power, source of wisdom, knowledge, and intelligence. And John is saying that this person became a man. A personal God who came into the world in the man Jesus. And then to the Hebrew... When the Hebrew sees the word Logos, they understand Logos being the Word of God. If you read the Old Testament over and over, you will read this passage. The Word of the Lord came to so and so. Or the Word of the Lord came to thus and such. Or the Word of the Lord came to this and that. The Word of the Lord was simply God revealing Himself. His person, His nature, His will, His wisdom, His truth. The Word of the Lord was the expression of the personal God. The true and loving God of the Old Testament. By His Word, God has spoken. John is saying to them that the revelation of God, the disclosure of God, the manifestation of God is now incarnate. The expression of God's nature, will, wisdom, and truth has been embodied in this man, Jesus. So no longer do we have some sort of impersonal force but we have something that we can relate to intimately. And no longer do we just have a word coming down. We have a word who is here and ever present with us. Hebrews 1, 1 through 2 says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. God is being revealed in Christ. You are hearing from God. You are seeing God unveiled. You are seeing God manifest. Now we have a quote that's up on your screen. This is from John MacArthur. This is what he said. God and His Word are one and the same because if God doesn't speak, we don't know anything about Him. When He does speak, everything He speaks is consistent with who He is. So when John uses this term logos, it is a term that appeals to both the Greek and the Hebrew. It is a term that's captured the attention of the Greek philosophers and the Jewish scholars and the average citizen. It was familiar to all. So what do we see? What do we see today when we see this word, when we try to understand how they say in the beginning was the word? Next slide. There are three divine traits. There are three divine traits of the word. The word is eternal. The word is equal, and the word is essential. We're going to hit both of those as quick as we can this morning. First of all, John shows us that the word became flesh by virtue of his pre-existence. So, in the beginning was the word, right? That's what it says. What beginning? The beginning of what? In the beginning of the beginning. This is a phrase taken right out of Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. The original beginning of everything that exists. In the beginning, when everything that exists came into existence, listen, the word already was. In other words, Jesus was already in existence when everything that exists came to existence. That's the statement. It's profound. It's the beginning when everything was created, the world already was. He is not a created being. He existed before anything that now exists, existed. Since time began with creation, whoever exists before time exists eternally. At the point where everything began, he already was. That is his pre-existence. John says in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. These few words, John informs us that the Word has existed from all eternity. At the beginning of time, the Word was already there with God. The Word has existed eternally. He already was when time began. At creation, the Word was already present. Your Mormons and your Jehovah's Witnesses and many others try to tell us that He was a created being. Matter of fact, and I didn't know this till I was doing the research, the Mormons say that God of the Bible was created by another God. That another God created the God of the Bible who then created Jesus. These are lies. Because they deny God being God and Christ being God. Not only did He exist in the beginning, He was with God. He was with God. It says it again. He was in the beginning already with God. When the beginning began, he was already existing. That's important. 
Jesus is not God's competitor. He is not an antagonist to God. He is not one of multiple gods. There are not two gods. There are not competing gods. He is with God. That term is proston theon. It literally means face to face with God. Face to face with God in intelligent personal communion. He is distinct from God because he is with God. He pre exists in fellowship with God. John 17, verse 5 says this, And now, O Father, this is Jesus praying in the garden. This is what he says. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. And what was that relationship that he had with his Father? The Bible tells us in Luke 3.22 at the baptism, when God says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. He's not a competitor to God. He's not another God. He's not a lesser God. He's before any creation existing, and He's existing now in intimate personal communication with the Father. And it's in this communion of love, perfect love, that is His preexistence. He is outside of creation, and He is before time. And if He is outside the creation and before time, He is eternal. And if He is eternal, He is God. Jesus is God. Just like God is. Okay? We got that part? Let's go on to the next part. The word is equal. This is coexistence. Not only does John speak of the pre-existence of Christ, but he speaks of the coexistence of Christ. John states that the Word was with God. Remember? Face to face. John indicates the Word is separate and distinguishable from the Father. He is a separate person. He was there with God. John 1, 1 through 3, 1 John 1, 1 through 3 tells us that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness, and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ." Those words that John tells us in the beginning are some of the most important words in all of Scripture for understanding who Jesus is. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was God, as much as the Father is God. Even so, the Word is God. He was with God, and He was God. He is equal with the Father, and the Word is God. So John tells us here that everything that makes God who He is Everything that makes God, God, the Word possesses. In other words, the Word is God in every essence. His nature, while He is separate from the Father in His personhood, He is one with God in His essence. That means that not the Word is not just a possessor of divine qualities or characteristics, but the Word participates in the reality we call God. The Word was true deity. The Word is God. In the beginning... He was with God, and He was God. We have here the mystery of the Trinity. God is three, and at the same time He's one. He is three distinct persons in three distinct offices of Father and Son and Holy Spirit, but He is of one essence. He is of one person. That is not something that's easy to explain. It's not something I can write on a 3 by 5 index card to tell you. But the reality is this, there are some things that happen that is orchestrated through the fathership of God. There are some things that happen in us that are orchestrated through the sonship of Jesus. And there are some things that happen in us that are orchestrated through the power of the Holy Spirit. But this is all coming from God. I do not have three separate gods. I do not have three thrones sitting in heaven. I have one God and one throne in heaven. But this God is distinctly personalized in three separate entities. Father, Word, Spirit. If I can explain it to you like this without messing with anybody's theology too much, 
I can explain it to you how God explained it to me so I can understand. This doesn't necessarily mean this is the end-all, be-all, because my mind can't compass the end-all, be-all of God. But this is how He explained it to me so I could grasp it in my finite mind. In the beginning was God. God is complete. God is whole. God is absolute. Every time I inhale, I take in oxygen. I take in particles. These oxygen and the particles that I take in help me to breathe. And then when I'm finished breathing, I exhale. I exhale carbon dioxide. God is completely whole. He doesn't have to breathe in anything to make Him more of a God. He doesn't have to absorb or consume anything to make Him more God. He doesn't evolve or change or characterize Himself with time. He is not becoming, He is being. And when He said, let there be, when He started existence, He was already there, He's always been there. When He started existence, He opened His mouth and said, let there be. And two things happened when He said, let there be. The Word was released and the breath was released. When I speak, my word comes out and my breath comes out. That means that the word of God, who is Jesus, and the breath of God, who is the Holy Spirit, was already there. God did not create them. They were already there with God completely, totally whole. So but when creation happened, God set them forth on their assigned tasks. What does the Word do? The Word creates. What does the breath do? The breath gives life. And these things work together with God equally to have everything that happens happen. The Word coexisted with God. The Word was God. That's the best way I can explain it to you. If you don't get it, I've got about 50 books in my office that I'd be happy to share with you. You can spend 60 years researching it, and then you can come preach that Sunday, and you can explain it to me. But the best I can tell you is this. Jesus has always been. God has always been. The Holy Spirit has always been. God shows Himself to us in different ways, at different times, in the way we need Him to be. The Holy Spirit was in the Old Testament. The Bible says the Holy Spirit would come upon the prophets and they would prophesy, but the Holy Spirit didn't stay there. Jesus probably showed up in the Old Testament. We have things called theophanies or Christophanies where we see a type and shadow of Jesus in the Old Testament. Do you remember? And I'm getting on a rabbit trail, but you'll have to get over it. Do you remember when Joshua was getting ready to go attack Jericho? And the Bible says the captain of the Lord of hosts came. And Joshua got on his face and bowed before him. That was probably a pre incarnation example of Jesus because Joshua worshipped him. In the Bible, if you see anybody bow to an angel, what's the angel say? Don't worship me. Don't worship me. But the captain of the army of the Lord, Joshua was able to worship. Abraham, after he fought with the five kings and came back, he ran into a man named Melchizedek who was called the Prince of Salem. He was a high priest, and Abraham gave tithe to him. We had no understanding of priest in the Bible yet. God hadn't established the priesthood yet. God hadn't established the tithe yet. This was a type and shadow of Jesus. So we see these things all throughout history. The Bible tells us in Revelations that Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. So God already had a plan in place for us to have a Redeemer. God already had a plan in place for us to have a Comforter, which was the Holy Spirit. All these things are orchestrated by God. And I have God, and I have God's Word, and I have God's Spirit. I have God the Father, I have God the Son, I have God the Holy Ghost. They are not impersonal forces. They are not chess pieces that God moves. They allow themselves to work through God. Jesus intentionally allowed himself to be humbled to personhood, to become a man. 
Eternity was birthed through mortality. Jesus got old as he grew. Jesus had joints that would get stiff. If Jesus had stayed a lot longer, his eyes would have started to go dim. Because he was perfection born in an imperfect body. He was completely God and completely man. Jesus allowed himself to have some of his glory removed so that he could walk on our earth with us. If God came down and walked on earth next to us, what would happen to us? What happens if I see God face to face in my mortal body with my mortal eyes? What happens if I hear God with my carnal ears? We know what happened when Moses went up on the mountain and talked to God. I said, God, show me your face. Show me your glory. God said, if you would see me, you would die. So Jesus had to intentionally allow himself to be humbled from where he was to come to earth to give us an opportunity to interact with God, to interact with our Heavenly Father. He pre-existed and he co-existed we read that this morning in Colossians 2.9. In Him all the fullness of deity dwells. He was with God, and He is God. And He is as much God as God is God. The Word is not an attribute to God. The Word is not a message from God. The Word is not an emanation from God. The Word is not a creation by God. The Word is God. He is a person with God and a person who is God. And I'll tell you this one too, and you can... Stone me after church. This is not the word that John is talking about. This is the Bible. This is an inspired, holy word that God gave to us through men who wrote the scriptures inspired by the Holy Spirit to tell us the history of redemption, to tell us the history of grace, to tell us the history of His Son. This is God speaking to us through His Word. But this is not the Word John's talking about. The Word is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Do not let this book become a God to you. This is a road map which points us to God. This is a road map which points us to our Creator. This is what tells us and gives us information about our Savior. That's why we have this Bible. That's why John wrote his gospel. That's why Paul wrote his epistles. To tell us about the Word. Okay? This is God's holy Word. This is not the Word. We got it? We got it. John informs us Christ is God. He's eternally God. There was never a time when the Son was not God. He supersedes the created order. He is equally God. The Word is as much God as the Father is God. And He is essentially God. Everything that makes God who He is, the Word possesses. He is the very nature of God. The Word is God. Charles Wesley wrote an old hymn. It says, And can it be that I should gain? That's the title, and this is the chorus. He left his father's throne above. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, would die for me? You just thought it was a praise and worship song. It's really an old hymn. There's nothing new under the sun. This is the heart and soul of Christianity. The Word was God. Clearest, most direct revelation of the deity of Jesus Christ on the pages of Scripture. The Word is God. He is with God as a separate person. Yet he is God by nature. He has the same nature and essence as God. That's the heart of the whole thing. The one who came into the world is God himself. He is God the Son who was eternally with God before anything existed. Pre-existent and co-existent with God. we got time for one more. And then I'm going to let you go home and eat lunch. Third thing. The word is essence. The word is self-existence. There's a third reality John wants us to understand. And not just that the Word is pre-existent, not just that the Word has coexistence, but the Word has self-existence. And that's when you get into the real substance of deity. When you talk about His pre-existence, you're talking about His eternity. When you talk about His coexistence, you're talking about His equality. But when you talk about His self-existence, you're talking about the essence of His nature. One is eternity, two is equality, three is essence. If self-essence is critical, there's an old term, 
and I don't have it on the screen, but I'll spell it for you. It's A-S-E-I-T-Y, the aseity of God. It's an obscure term, but it means the self-existence of God. What does that mean? John goes on to tell us, he says, In him was life. In him was life. John 5.26 says, For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. And what that saying is this, life was in him. He didn't receive power from any other source. He didn't develop life from some other power. This is self-existence. He wasn't given life. He didn't receive life. He possessed his life as an essentialness of his nature. In him was life. That's why Jesus would say things like, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. This is the truth of the self-existence of God. This is reality concerning Jesus Christ that's foundational to the Christian faith. If I can't believe that in Jesus is everything that I need, if I can't believe that in Jesus is every aspect of life, I do not have a relationship with Him. I just have an abstract notion of Him. In Him is life. John goes on to say this. What does he say? Verse 3. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. How did God create the earth? What did He say? Let there be. He spoke. When He spoke, what did He speak? He spoke the Word. So that means Jesus was an integral part of the creation process. As a matter of fact, the Word is what God used to permeate all of creation. Everything that happened came through the Word. Everything that we are comes through the Word. How did God give us salvation? Through the Word. How did God redeem us back to Himself from a fallen sin nature? Through the Word. How are we going to reign with Him in eternity forevermore in heaven? Through the Word. Everything goes through the Word of God. John's testimony is, in Him was life. He contains it. He is the source of life. Like I said before, we are becoming. If I look in the mirror and I hold a picture of myself from 10 years ago next to my reflection now, I will see that I am becoming. I may not like what I'm becoming, but I am becoming. I am never the same. I am always something different. I am always becoming something more until I get to a place where I become no more and then my soul spends eternity with heaven. But as long as I have life, I am becoming something. As long as the world has life, it is becoming something. It continues to turn. It continues to rotate. It continues. We continue to find new things and different things. And things happen because life is a process, a linear progression of becoming. But Jesus is not becoming. Jesus always is. He is eternally now. That's why I can say that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday as He is today, as He is forever. When Moses was on the mountain and he was talking to God, and he said, okay, God, who do I say sent me? And God said, I am sent you. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Now look, God didn't say, I was the God of Abraham. I was the God of Isaac. I was the God of Jacob. He didn't talk about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the past tense, even though they were dead for hundreds of years at this point in the Scripture. What He said was, I am the God. So God is eternity. He is always now. That's why He always shows up right on time. You think that's coincidence? Do you think that's coincidence that God always shows up right when we need Him? No, He's already there. Time has no meaning to God. God is not a linear God. God is always here, just like He was always there, and just like He will always be there. He is a constant now. And Jesus is always there. So the life that I have in Jesus, I don't have to worry about it going away 
because He is always there, and because He's always there, my hope and my faith and trust in Him can always be there. He doesn't have to go back on a cross and be crucified again every time a new person is born. He doesn't have to go back to the cross and be crucified again every time I mess up and stumble and backslide. Jesus had to die one time for everything because He is eternally now. Everything came through Him. Everything that we have came through Him. Every single passage, every chapter, every verse in this book points to Him. Everything points to Jesus. God flows through His Word to reach His children. Who is His Word? Jesus. So how does God reach His children? Through His Son. And now I can have a relationship with Him. Now I can have a relational impression of Him. Now I can see God with my eyes. Now I can hear God with my ears. Now I can understand God in a level that I never could before because I've met His Son. Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Fully God, fully man, three and one. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. We're going to stop there if I can have someone come to the piano, please. John started right away with absolute evidence of who Jesus really was. Jesus is not just a man. He's not just a prophet. He's not just a high priest. He's not just our King of Kings and our Lord of Lords. He's not just our Savior and our Redeemer. He's not just the Lamb. He is the Son of God. And if I take anything away from His deity, if I try to move Him down any lower than He is, I am rejecting the personhood of the Son. I'm rejecting His ability to work through me. If He's the Word, then He can speak into my life today. If He's the Word, then He can speak into your life today. Allow Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, our Savior, our Redeemer, our High Priest, and our soon coming King to be the Word of God in your life. In the beginning was the Word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, today for your word. God, I hope I was able to, in the jumblings and the ramblings of my human tongue, express this profound truth that your son is your son. He is you, God. I exalt your holy name. I thank you for your son. I thank you for your Holy Spirit. I thank you for you and who you are. I thank you how the three of you are three persons but one essence and how you work through history and you work through personality and you work through our lives and I feel the presence today. I thank you for the word. I thank you for the word today. Help us this week to draw closer to you. Help us this week to invite those around us, our friends and family and neighbors, to be back here in church next week as we celebrate your Son and give Him the honor and the glory that is due Him as He is the Word of God. In all these things we give you praise. In all these things we give you honor. In all these things we exalt your holy name for you are God. And there is none like you. We praise you today, O oh Lord. Bless us as we go. Keep us safe till we come back. We worship you, our Lord and our God. You're dismissed. God bless you.